we'll now call the meeting of the Waco City Council October 20th, 2020 to order at 3 p.m. Joining me online today are Mayor Pro Tem Andrea Bearfield, Council Member Hector Sabido, mm -hmm. Council Member John Kennard, Council Member Darius Ewing, Council Member Jim Holmes. Uh, now please join us for a moment of silence. Thank you. On March 16, 2020, the governor suspended various provisions of the Open Meetings Act pursuant to his state of disaster authority. This change was effective until March 16, 2020, effect was effective March 16, 2020, until further notice or until the state of disaster declaration expires. In accordance with physical, physical guidance, physical distancing guidelines, and while providing as much transparency as possible, this meeting will not be open to the public. This meeting is being broadcast live at WCCC.tv. The audio is also being recorded, and the video and audio recordings will be available to the public. According to the governor and attorney general, statutes that may require face-to-face -face interaction between members of the public and public officials are suspended, provided, however, that the governmental body offers alternative methods of communication with our public officials. This includes public comment on agenda items. In an effort to allow for as much public input as possible, those who wish to submit their written comments on a listed agenda item were asked to submit their comments to the city secretary's office by 11 a.m. today. The city secretary will read into the record the comments submitted for items on the agenda at the appropriate time. Individuals who registered to speak on a public hearing item will be allowed to speak remotely for three minutes. We will now recess the regular session and reconvene to work session with a report from the city manager. Bradley? Thanks, Mayor and Council. Good afternoon to each of you. We don't have any changes to the agenda today. I do have one employee recognition and organizational update, and I'd like uh, Jennifer Ritchie, city attorney, to provide. Good afternoon. Um, sitting at the table today, you'll see Kim Coogan, who joined our city attorney's office on Monday, October 12th as an assistant city attorney. Uh, Kim has been practicing law for 28 years, most recently for uh, as an assistant city attorney for the city of Galveston. So she's moved to Waco from Galveston. And she spent 12 years in the Texas Attorney General's office. She is board certified in personal injury trial law. and spent much of her career at the AG's office, as I mentioned, litigating cases involving public safety professionals. Uh, for the city of Waco, she'll be supporting the city secretary's office, convention and visitors bureau, human resources, library, and Texas Ranger Hall of Fame. She also, uh, with a couple of other attorneys in the office, will be uh, assisting in uh, litigation. So I'd like to welcome uh, Kim to our office. Very good. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Next up, uh, Mayor, I'd like to invite Larry Holsey to give his Holsey report. All right. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Pay attention to your monitors. We have some great things to talk about. Okay. Surge testing began Wednesday, October the 7th, and continues through the end of each month. Uh, to date, 4,918 of the available tests have been given to anyone who wants them. Of those tests, 3,240 results have been received with 213 positive cases identified, helping better identify and quarantine those with the virus to hopefully help slow the spread. Thanks to a large collaborative effort led by the Waco McLennan County Office of Emergency Management, test sites are open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. seven days a week. The media has really helped get the word out uh, with most of them using the additional information we provide in the daily press release updates from the health district. It gives the information on where free tests can be done the very next day. And the news reports regularly are including this information in their daily st stories on the COVID case counts. An extensive communication plan continues with twice a day social media posts and boosts, electronic billboards, radio and TV interviews, an extensive radio spot campaign, especially in the Hispanic listeners, and a TV spot program that uh, promotion that simply says the message is fast, it's fast, it's easy, it's free, get tested. It's fast. It's free. It's easy. It's easy. It's gratis. It's easy, get tested. It's fast, it's free, it's easy. Es rápido, es fácil, es gratis. Hágase la prueba. Get tested. Get tested. With many of the popular seasonal events being canceled, like Cultural Arts Fest, National Night Out, Heart of Texas Fair, and the Veterans Day Parade, all of our area museums are open and providing educational experiences for people of all ages. 
Some with new exhibits like Baylor's Maver Museum that now has a new life-size cast of a fossilized a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton in the rotunda area of the Mayburn's front foyer. It's on loan for the next two years from the Perot Museum of Nature and Science in Dallas. Early voting started Tuesday, October the 13th, and all reports indicate a great turnout. The last date to vote early and in person is October the 30th. Early voting locations are McLennan County Elections Administration Office Building, Robinson Community Center, First Assembly of God, of Church, uh, First Assembly of God Church, Waco Multipurpose Center, and the Hewitt City Hall. Polls are open today, October the 20th through uh, Friday, October the 23rd from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Saturday, October 24th, the polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., as well as on Sunday, October the 25th from 1 to 6 p.m. Beginning Monday, October the 26th through Friday the 30th, polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Application to vote by mail must be received no later than the close of business on October the 23rd. For more information on where to uh, apply for a, a ballot by mail, a view, uh, ballot information, or any more information about polling location, you can visit the Waco County, McLennan County uh, office, election office website, which is also available from the city's website. Here's a quick update on some building Waco projects going on. Replacement of a 40-year-old Ritchie Road 2 million gallon water tower is on schedule. The pedestal of the new tower is complete. Crews are now welding the, to get the tank together and soon it will be raised into place. The new tower uh, project is about 60% complete, which includes the demolition of the old tower. The new 2 million gallon water tower should, uh, should be operational by July of 2021. The demolition of the old tower will be the final step in this overall $4.4 million project expected to wrap up in September of 2021. And the rehab uh, and replacement of a vital 48-inch water line running underneath the Landon Branch Bridge on Lakeshore Drive is well underway. It began with necessary tree removal. Lane closures and lane shifting will continue throughout the project to minimize traffic interruptions. This $3.4 million project is expected to wrap up in February or March of 2021, depending on weather conditions. And that completes my report. Great report, Larry. It's always great to see everything that's going on. I really appreciate your, um, your team's effort to get the word out about uh, the testing. Um, that is a huge effort that is uh, being conducted by multiple partners, including uh, the EOC, as you mentioned, as well as the uh, health district. Um, and our city and the county, uh, the uh, Texas Department of Emergency Management, and the governor's office and the federal government and the state military, uh, plus all our partners that are allowing us to use uh, their premises to sites, including MCC and uh, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Um, we are trying so hard to get these tests to the people that need them. Um, several of us have, have had the test. My wife and I personally did the, the nasal test at MCC. It is not a bad test. You administer it yourself. And as they said, it's quick and easy and it's free, get tested. Um, this can make a difference to our community. So I really appreciate the work on that uh, and everything else that's going on in the community. It's, it's just, it's always good to have these updates. So we realize all the great things our, our, uh, our city departments are doing. So thank you. Thanks for those comments, Mayor. Um, we do not have any informal reports on the agenda today. Um, from a public hearing standpoint, we have four. Uh, Clint Peters, our Director of Development Services, will be covering the first three public hearings in the work session in a few moments. And the last public hearing, 2020-745, I'll cover for a moment. Uh, it's a public hearing for the drainage, municipal drainage utility system. This item includes both a public hearing and consideration on first reading an ordinance to establish a drainage utility in the city of Waco. And as you know, development of a proposed drainage utility began more than a year ago in conjunction with development of the stormwater master plan. Currently, major improvements to the city's stormwater system are paid through tax-supported bonds, which are also funding streets, facilities, and parks and recreation improvements. Given there's a significant need for these types of improvements and the fact the city's stormwater system has a replacement value approaching three quarters of a billion dollars, a dedicated funding source for stormwater is necessary. In addition to these competing capital needs, there's also a need to expand our maintenance efforts and address stormwater quality mandates from the federal and state governments. The ordinance in front of you today establishes the utility. It doesn't charge a fee. If this ordinance is approved, the amounts to be charged will be considered on November 3rd, 2020, following a public hearing. 
Staff will recommend the charges will recommend that charges begin October 1st of 2021. Establishment of the drainage utility is consistent with our city's strategic goals to improve in infrastructure, support sustainability and resiliency, as well as creating a culture of equity. Staff brings this forward with our recommendation of adoption of the ordinance on first reading today. And I'd really like to acknowledge the work done by the team, including our consultant Walker Partners, as well as staff members, Amy Bilarly Highland and her team, uh, John Patterson in the city attorney's office, and finally, assistant city manager, Paul Kane. Resolutions today, I wanted to highlight, uh, we have- uh, Brett, Bradley, I just uh, wanted to comment on the uh, stormwater issue, if I could. Um, but yeah, I, I'll thank you and, and appreciate with that work of staff uh, uh, and, and everybody there and the consultant, Walker Partners and all the work that they've done. I know it's like 100 and to over 100 million, 120 million of projects in the next 10 years we're trying to cover with this, uh, with this stormwater uh, utility. And uh, we're targeting, just to remind everybody, we're targeting just a little over 6 million a year to support this enterprise uh, through this public utility. Uh, and currently we're using the general fund, which is funded by property tax and sales tax. And so I, I, I uh, support this public utility just basically because I think it makes more sense to match the, the fee structure to where the need has been created, uh, which there is a clear need for uh, infrastructure improvements uh, as evidenced by the 120 plus million of, of uh, projects there. Um, I know that in the consultant's report, and I think we've mentioned it too, that our goal has been to be equitable uh, and proportional to, to the burden placed on the drainage system uh, for, for these fees. And it's based on uh, impervious cover. So again, I'm supportive of the utility and, and setting that up today. The couple of questions that I did have on it, and I know this is more for the next meeting where we talk about the fees. Um, and I think the consultant uh, had a, a, a page on this um, relative to uh, credits. Uh, and specifically in the suggested rate structure, uh, it was mentioned rates do not include credits in exchange for installing and maintaining features that reduce the contribution to the storm drain system. And also was a comment of the, there's an opportunity here to promote green infrastructure elements, such as bioretention facilities, wetlands, bioswales, previous pavements, rainwater harvesting, et cetera. So I think some businesses have already invested material capital into uh, the stormwater need or, or, uh, the, the structure that's already there that they put in place and paid for and to uh, go forward with this fee structure without reflect better reflecting that the credits that we're possibly talking about with the consultant. And I didn't see it in the, in the first draft of the ordinance. Um, and I know there's, it's possible that it's in section 26, 368 C, but that goes to the director may credit. I would prefer that there'd be a more objective drainage design standard manual or something where people can say, hey, if I've got this, this works its way into the to the fee. And maybe that's in the, it will, I guess we'll work out the details in the next meeting, but uh, maybe that's in the fee structure itself and not in the context of the ordinance. But I just, I just wanted to be clear that there's a couple of places where I think that we need to be thinking about as we set this utility up. And, you know, for some small businesses in town right now, it's, it's, they'll see it as a, the optics or this is another fee. But I think what this council is trying to do is move, to me, this is a, a two-tiered uh, deal. We are trying to uh, place this fee where it belongs with the stormwater infrastructure and improvement system and hand-in-hand uh, -hand go with uh, some tax property tax relief and out of our general fund. So some of this is geographical, I get it, but I think ultimately what we'll see is some uh, relief on the, the property tax side. Um, again, thanks for all the work by the staff uh, and, and uh, Jed uh, on the consulting. And uh, I think as we get into this, uh, get into this fee next week, if we can be thinking about how we maybe tailor that uh, ordinance to accommodate uh, credits into that, uh, into the fee structure, I'd, I'd appreciate it. 
I, I just want to also uh, piggyback a little bit on what Council Member Holmes said. You know, I uh, I'm also in support of this municipal drainage utility system. Um, one thing that he said just resounded with me, and that is the message that we're trying to get out is that we're we're doing this to provide, hopefully down the road, some relief for our ratepayers and taxpayers. And and with that money that's coming out of our general fund right now, we're not allowed to use to do that as much as we would like to, uh, but passing this public hearing will allow us the opportunity down the road. And and I know there's been this perception that you know we're doing this in the middle of a pandemic, but uh, also just wanna reiterate the fact that this won't go into effect till the fourth quarter of 2021. Um, and so we, we are definitely listen to every concern that is out there. We wanna hear every concern that is out there. But I think, you know, uh, as, as Council Member Holmes mentioned, we are, we are tasked with how do we provide some of that relief for our constituency um, that have been in their homes 30, 40 years. And, and um, this is just one of those ways that we feel that the direction that we need to take to provide that some, at least a little bit of relief. And so I as well, I wanna thank staff for all of their work that they've done on this. Um, I know there are still questions about this. And so please know that uh, we as council, well, I don't want to speak for my council members. I, I have made myself available for questions for any businesses that, that, that are in the area, but but I hope you would you would allow us to uh, uh, guide through this process and 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 we we're doing this with the best uh, mind at hand. And so thank you for that. those comments council members city secretary uh hudson reminded me we do have a um a need to back up and receive some public comments on item work session 736 we do we have um alan northcat submitted an item related to work session 736 at new exhibits at local museums item e um, his comment is the wake of friends of the climate announces a new free exhibit entitled the fourth annual climate crisis art exhibit which in light of the ongoing pandemic is virtual. The community wide show has about 85 entries by artists of all ages from pre K to adult recognizing the fact that everyone is impacted by man made climate change. Council members are invited to view this exhibit and observe the children express their deep concern with climate change and the vigorous action by the council to decarbonize Waco is rec required to preserve their futures. All Waco citizens are also invited. The exhibit is free and is available in October and November and may be seen at climatecrisisartexhibit.org. And Mayor and Council, there was an attachment to his comments, which I forwarded to you and is in the record. And that's all I have. Thank you, Bradley. Sure, sure. Mayor and Council, we do have 16 resolutions on the agendas today, and I'd like to highlight just a couple. Uh, resolutions 2020, 756 and 757 are uh, items that facilitate the continued park improvements at Trailblazer Park. Uh, and include the purchase of playground equipment and a picnic pavilion. These two pieces of uh, infrastructure will be installed as part of the $613,000 improvement project at Trailblazer Park, which we anticipate will be completed by January 2021. Additionally, Resolution 2027-59 wanted to highlight, it awards a contract to Big Creek Construction for the 2020 Street Preservation Phase Three project an authorization, authorization that doesn't exceed $826,000. The uh, This award is for the base bid as well as alternates, uh, which came in pleasantly to our surprise at about 30% under the engineer's original estimate for the work. Hey, hey, Bradley, this is Hector. I also wanna comment on resolution uh, 759. First of all, uh, I think it's great that this proposed bid came in uh, almost a third less than what is anticipated. Uh, but even I, I want to appreciate for, uh, the work that is being done with this resolution. I think three out of the four projects um, on this resolution are in District, T, District 2, excuse me, uh, some much needed uh, road work and street work in, in, on some of our major uh, roads here in South Waco. And so I really want to appreciate uh, for seeing this through and I fully support this resolution. Thank you, Council Member. We do have two ordinances on the agenda today. Uh, ordinance 2027-62 is a first reading to amend the code of ordinances to add Appendix C entitled Impact Fees and to establish roadway impact fees within Waco's city limits. 
and water and wastewater impact fees within the city limits and the extraterritorial jurisdiction. First reading of the ordinance today is, is a culmination of a process that began about two and a half years ago with council's approval to award a contract to Freeze and Nichols to perform an impact fee study. Uh, a public hearing on this item was held at our pri prior meeting on October 6th um, and included a detailed presentation from staff on the proposed fee. Throughout the process, city staff has worked with uh, the Capital Improvement Advisory Committee as well as stakeholder groups to craft the ordinance before you today. And as been previously discussed, you know, our, our intent here is impact fees are a tool to relieve the burden of paying for new growth from existing taxpayers and ratepayers by shifting a portion of the cost to new development and new growth. While state law does allow Waco to recover 50% of the cost for new growth on infrastructure, the proposed ordinance would collect about a third of that cost and only once full fees are fully implemented in year five. We've also included uh, caps uh, to limit commercial impact fees and included important reductions or exemptions for business retention, development within the core of the city and along major corridors, as well as for affordable housing. This proposed ordinance is consistent with our council's strategic goals to improve infrastructure, support sustainability and resiliency, create a culture of equity, as well as facilitating economic development. Staff does bring this forward with our recommendation on first reading and, and for their significant work in this project. Uh, let me recognize Eddie Haas and Jessica Vassar of Friesen Nichols, as well as our staff, um, Clint Peters, again, Amy Bellarly Highland, Lisa Tyre, Assistant City Attorney Judith Benton, and Assistant City Manager Paul Kane. The remaining ordinance on the agenda is a, is a second reading, and if there's no further questions, that concludes my report. Just, uh, this is Holmes again, on the, on the impact fee um, ordinance. Um, again, again, kind of wrapping up, $165 million of impact fee for road road roadways, water, and wastewater projects in the next 10 years. That's a lot of money that we need to figure out how we're going to pay for. And, and I think this council does not want to place a higher stress on property taxes. So this is kind of the genesis of impact fees, as you mentioned. It, it bases the fee on where there is the need for the roads and the water lines and the wastewater systems and places the cost where the impact is created. So uh, th there is a delicate balance here. I think we all realize that, you know, paying using the impact fees to pay for the infrastructure, uh, we don't want to disincentivize uh, development. That's a key part of what we're trying to do here in Waco is, uh, is, is, is grow Waco thoughtfully. We had some great news this morning on uh, Amazon and the, this, the, I just think the outlook for this city is so bright and we're set up uh, very well to to grow with the with that outlook. Um, so thoughtful implementation is very crucial and, and critical here. And I, I'll echo you that uh, staff and and uh, Fries and Nichols have done a great job in, in, in figuring out how to work this. On the residential side, um, and really both sides of it, the five year phase in. I mean, if you start looking at the details and see. We are not pushing this fee out immediately in year one. This is actually not even going into effect until next year. And then there's a 20% of what we are targeting per year. So the full effect isn't until uh, 2026 or 2025, 2026. So there is a phase up both on commercial and residential. Um, we're grandfathering a lot of the platting status into the, into the ordinance, um, not paid until the deal's permitted. Um, and exemptions in in uh, different parts of the city. Um, and uh, on the commercial side in particular, we, we have some legacy business exemptions, which I think are important, some no change in use exemptions, which I think is very important, and some urban core uh, building exemptions as well. Um, the commercials was a little bit harder, and it's still, uh, it's still, uh, it's not a widget-like deal, kind of like the, the uh, the residential side of it, where we can kind of look pretty clearly at what it is. It involves quasi-complex. Maybe you take the quasi out of it. It <laughs> involves a complex, a complex because you have so many different property types uh, and location and water use, potential water use, try to anticipate that. Stormwater, because all this is based on, as, as we know, stormwater, water, and road uh, needs. Um, 
the, the, and I know today we're approving both the impact fee and the fee structure, as I understand it. And I guess my, my only reservation on this deal has been that we have the framework, and, I, and again, this is a very complex, uh, particularly on the commercial side, on how we are calculating it. And the fees kind of feel like they're right. Oh, oh so that, that's good. But uh, I still don't have an idea of the scale. And to me, if we have this fee structure where we've kind of finally landed on, um, to be able to say, hey, what would, the, what would this fee structure do on projects that were, uh, that would have been subject to that impact fee structure in 2018, 2019, uh, in 2020, trailing three years, as you know, we say in the, in the banking business. But I, I wish we could have seen that part, just an idea, because I don't know whether this fee is going to raise 10 million, 50 million, 5 million, 2 million. Uh, I would have liked to have seen the trailing three years of, and then had an opportunity to review that data, then tweak the, maybe you tweak different parts of it if it's not enough or too much. But um, as I understand it, as I've kind of reviewed it, I'm not sure we have the latitude to change it any more of the fees in this ordinance. Is that, can you advise me on that? Or how, what, what are the, if we do go forward with this calculator, which I think everybody's going to, we're going to want to do to do our budget next year anyway. Uh, what, at what point do we look at that and say, whoops, you know, whatever this industrial calculation was messed up. What's the first opportunity to look at that fee and possibly change it. So let me speak to the, the calculator first, and then I, I think I'll turn it over to city attorney to, to answer the second part of the question. Staff anticipates an online calculator being available in about 90 days. We're working with uh, Friesen Nichols to produce that, and we anticipate that'll be interactive and online, as I said, in about 90 days. Uh, to the, the second part of the question, I'll turn it over to city attorney. So um, I think what you're referring to is the um, there is a strict statutory process uh, that uh, cities have to go to, through to um, to um, assess impact fees. And as y'all know, and as uh, the city managers reflected, that's been a two and a half year process for us from the beginning <laughs> until now. Um, so today, what's in front of y'all is the impact fee ordinance, which, which includes the the schedule. Um, throughout the process, there will be updates to the CIAC board about how this is going and what is going forward. And um, at, at, at any time throughout this process, we could go back and, and relook at this. We'd have to start through the process again, uh, but but you could we could relook at this throughout the process. So start what part of the process? I guess I mean we don't have to start from two and a half years ago, but we'll do. I'm just trying to get familiar with if, if uh, the CIAC continues to review the, the 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 fee structure and as we implement it, is there opportunity for tweaks in there as we see something that clearly was an unintended consequence? So you would have to go back to the CIAC process again. And at some level, you may have to do the study again and start, it, it just depends on what you're trying to tweak and at what point you're trying to tweak it. <coughs> Yeah, the public hearing process, the notices, and all of that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, and the only way to reset what we're doing today would be to, to go all the way, or to go back to this public hearing, uh, re, redo the public hearing process. So I don't know. Is this, the statute. I just want to, I, I just want to, I just want to, I guess I already said this, get an idea of scale. What are we talking about? Unintended consequences, because this is kind of our last look at it uh, today, and this, it's our first, kind of our first and last look as far as the final numbers. Yeah. So I'm a little hesitant to, uh, if, there, if there's a if there's a, a feature here that allows us to look at it again after the calculations are all uh, done. I, I guess I would prefer to have that kind of. Uh, that, that kind of option, that kind of condition in here. And, and I guess if you're telling me that's not available in the ordinance, I mean, that's, so it, that's what it, it is what it is. Right. The, the, the statutory process I was just talking about, if it's run 
uh, completely efficiently is about a 90 day process with all the notices and everything where you could go back in and, and tweak that process. The statutory process does provide that council must approve the impact fees within 30 days of the recommendation, the public hearing. And so, and so, um, and so that's kind of the timeline we're, we're operating on for this ordinance that's in front of you right now. Okay. So does this, this process go back to the, explain to me on how it again comes back to that CIAC or, I'm, or I'm they, gonna ask, are they done? Uh, I'm going to ask Assistant City Attorney Judith Bitten to walk you through the process. Okay. So on tonight's uh, agenda, the fees are set in the ordinance. And according to the statute, we have 30 days from last meeting to impose these fees. The fees that we have calculated, that Freeze and Nichols has calculated, is based on the um, capital improvement projects that we have looked at for the next 10 years um, with some adjustments for growth. In order, if you pass it tonight, we can amend at any time, but you would have to amend the amounts to amount, amend the amounts, you would have to go through the process again of recalculating fees, setting public hearings, having the CAIC look at it again, and then have new ordinances to come forward. Okay. So, and this again, the way this one's different from the, the stormwater, stormwater is just, it's going to be another Utility fee, we look at it every year, we establish it. First of all, we establish the initial fees, which we'll try to do next next meeting. And then every year we look at it and say, hey, these weren't quite right. These are, you know, we can adjust those if they're not working right. This is one that we are putting in place and without a, a I guess a 90 day process, I'm not sure how that gets cranked up. Uh, this is set for the next five years, is that, correct or or less the council can revisit the fees anytime within the next five years the statute says it has to be reviewed every five years but council can review it prior to that the way this is currently set up we will not even start collecting fees for about two years so that puts us into 2022 23 i believe um and so to look at it, it would actually, it would make sense that you look at it after we start collecting to see. So is that, is that something that would go in the ordinance that we look at it after two years or is that just the fu a future council can decide by resolution or whatever that, hey, it's time to look at this, time yes. to look at this. Uh, you don't need to put that in the ordinance. That can be a future council can decide to look at it. The uh, statute provides that the CIAC, uh, the advisory committee, review how it is being um, processed every semi-annually to provide a report to the council. And thereby, when you get that report, you can then make a determination as to whether or not you would like to start a process to amend the fees. So there is a semi-annual report that comes out of there and, and CIAC will kind of be plugged into that and can, yes. you know, uh, uh, can flavor it up on, and, and say, hey, this is working. I don't know if they make recommendations, but at least they can, the report, I guess, will say something. That, yes, the report will give you a basis as to whether or not it's working or what should, if there needs to be some tweaking. And then at that point, council could, future councils could say, you know, let's start the 90-day process and look at it one more time or whatever. Yes. Okay. Um, Judith, thank you for that. Thank, that's uh, some clarification there. You're um, welcome. But that's that's all I had. No, oh, and I'll just say five with much more brevity than that. Um, but, uh, I appreciate. <laughs> you know, I love you, Jim. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I appreciate I can't, the can't process. I appreciate the conceit behind this project. Um, it is, you know, the whole point of the work of the capital committee and the consultants and everything over the past two years has been to identify by, you know, there are assumptions involved with this, but the, the future growth 
um, and then the infrastructure needed to serve that growth. And then we're taking a percentage of the cost of building that infrastructure and assigning it to that prospective future growth. And so going forward, you'll be able to revisit those assumptions to make sure that that anticipated growth is still happening um, and that the fees are still reasonable um, and that the capital projects that were deemed necessary are still deemed to be necessary. And, and Judith and staff did a great job of going through that whole process. Um, but I, but I, I really do think that, you know, assigning a portion of the cost of the infrastructure necessary to serve that new development, um, this whole process and, and having that development share in this cost makes sense, both on the residential and the commercial side. Um, I think the fact that uh, that the calculator, you know, I, I, I know I can understand wanting to go back a few years, but part of the reason why it's probably very difficult to do so and why it's going to take three months to build the calculator that uh, developers will be able to use uh, is because, as our consultants uh, pointed out, there are so many um, exceptions and exemptions and caveats and carve outs uh, within the policy that we've created um, and that it is it, it is atypical for this kind of thing. And I think that that level of accommodation speaks to the fact that we have listened to uh, the developers' concerns. And I think that the policy we've crafted in this before us today to adopt, while, while you know, probably not absolutely perfect, but it, it addresses the needs, the calculations make sense, the assumptions make sense, and it's it's something that we've all recognized we need to do. Um, and I'm I'll, I'm fully supportive of, of going ahead and getting the whole thing, understanding that uh, that it is built on those assumptions and that y'all do have a process is was just spelled out to revisit it down the road. Well, I, I really appreciate all the work the staff and, and our consultants have done on this. I mean, it has been a long road. And, and to, to talk about the fact that we've started this two years ago, we started this discussion before as part of the, the comprehensive planning process that was concluded in 2016. So we've really been talking about this for five or six years now and intensely for the last two years. Um, so I think it's uh, the fact that we are only at full implementation full implementation of this covering a third of the cost of the infrastructure for new development and that we are rolling it in 20% per year starting next summer is, um, you know, there's plenty of room there. If, there. if something comes up that doesn't look right, I think you can make that adjustment. And in the meantime, it will be such a small number because it's only 20% and then 40% the next year that the significance of it will not be material. And um, so I would just encourage us to go ahead and get this done and get it started. It is going to be uh, an evolving document and an evolve, evolving fee structure. And um, so I think we're, we're behind the other cities that are uh, comparable and that we want to be like uh, in getting this done. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hopefully getting this passed tonight. Appreciate it. Hey guys. Uh, in full support of impact fees, I don't think there's anyone that I've talked to on the matter that, that doesn't understand the need to have some sort of skin in the game from the, the development that we're incentivizing to be here um, to allow for continued growth to take place. Obviously, I think anyone can look at um, our, our city and the trajectory that we're on and see you know, there's no way to sustain this growth with the city footing the bill for every infrastructure cost solely uh, going forward as we're experiencing this growth. So in full and total support of impact fees um, and, and even in the way that we have it laid out currently, um, I think it's it's really important to look at it from, from an equity perspective and from the, from the perspective of... Uh, you know, there's there's reasons why we give exemptions in the city core because we want infill uh, development and and we don't want people that live in the city core to have to have their rates increase for any infrastructure improvements that are happening on the outside and the outskirts of the city, uh, while still understanding that those jobs that are on the outskirts of the city can provide employment to people that live in the city. Um, that's not a one to one guarantee that they're going to see that benefit. Um, so, I just think. Um, you know, it's really important just to say and to know that, um, you know, the purpose of these fees is to make sure that we grow in a way that is fair and equitable to citizens and to businesses uh, so that they do have that buy-in um, as a part of the infrastructure that, that we're providing for them. And even to note um, that it really is just a small percentage 
of the total cost um, that uh, of that infrastructure um, that we're shifting to the developers on that. Um, but I think I think we've been uh, really really fair with with the, the rates we set out um, and 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 how we are ramping this up over the course of five years. Um, one thing that you know I would like to have maybe a little bit more information on um, is just a projection of, you know, what we can expect to see in property tax relief uh, from this line item um, fee that we're, we're taking money for a specific purpose and attributing it to a specific purpose so that we're not having to take that from the general fund uh, that's funded by property taxes. So if there's any sort of, uh, you know, projection we could, we could start working on um, to show, Hey, this is, you know, maybe not year one, maybe not year two, because again, we're ramping it up, but when this is fully in effect, this is sort of the, the property tax relief uh, that you'll see um, from impact fees as a benefit. So that's that. Thanks. All right. Thank you, council members, for your uh, comments there. And we'll, um, we'll certainly have a few follow-ups to provide after that discussion. Mayor, that concludes my report, and I think we're ready for work sessions, if you are. Oh, hey, real quick, Bradley, I just want to go back to Resolution 752, uh, the contract with Motorola. Um, just for the benefit of my uh, colleagues who will be on here after me, I, I still have a, a slight bad taste in my mouth from a few years ago when after uh, Motorola bid one of our radio towers, um, within like nine months of that being completed, uh, they came back to us and said that a six-figure part that had been a component of said bid uh, was they were going to consider obsolete when no longer service, and we had to replace it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I'm glad to see that uh, as part of this annual service agreement that uh, it says that hardware will be upgraded and replaced if required to maintain the existing feature and functionality. I would hope that that language is strong enough to preclude another situation like what happened a few years ago where I feel like they sold us a piece of equipment they knew was going to be obsolete in the very near future and then force us to upgrade it. Um, and I, I do understand that once you are in this ecosystem and once you are tethered to this to a particular company like this that does have all the towers, um, that you have limited recourse. Um, but to the extent that we do, um, and just to the, for the benefit of my colleagues who will be viewing such contracts in years forward, I would like that little bit of institutional uh, knowledge to pass on um, just to watch out for this in particular and that uh, another situation like that doesn't happen again. I appreciate you bringing that up, John. And I, I remember that the same kind of uh, feeling that you do. Yeah, so just that's it. All right, okay. since, John, since John went back into the resolutions, I'm gonna do the same thing. Back on 756 and 757 Trailblazer Park. Uh, just happy to see this coming to fruition. I know the, the, the folks in West Highway 84 neighborhoods have been looking forward to this for a long time. And uh, Nathan Embry, who's the, the uh, neighborhood association head out there and Libby Kane have been working on this project forever, it seems like. And I'm just happy to see it, uh, happy to see the equipment and the pavilion get up out there. Appreciate staff's work on this. Thank you, Jim. Any further comments or questions on any of the resolutions or any of the items we've discussed so far? Okay, are there any items council would like to remove from the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, the consent agenda will include resolutions 2020-746 through 2020-761. Um, and I will turn it back to Bradley to introduce our next uh, work session presentation. Thanks, Mayor. We have uh, Clint Peters, Director of Development Services, joining us for a discussion of tonight's uh, planning public hearing agenda items. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. We just have uh, three public hearings uh, this evening. Uh, the first one is a uh, for a short-term rental uh, type two uh, for FWC Hands Across Waco, Inc. Uh, at a, a property located at 3621 Trice Avenue. Uh, this is a three-bedroom home uh, at the intersection of Trice and 37th in our Dean Highland Neighborhood Association uh, in North Waco. Um, they are proposing, uh, of course, to be uh, a three-bedroom short-term rental. It is in single-family zoning. Uh, you can see here the uh, nearby other uh, short-term rentals uh, well with, uh, outside the 500-foot buffer uh, that's required. 
Uh, they do, uh, one, one condition we have on this special permit is they are lacking uh, the required parking. So they do have a plan uh, to install some additional parking to meet the parking requirement. Uh, and this will be uh, required before they can be issued their uh, short term rental license. And you can see the, the picture here of the home. Uh, there was no opposition on this one from the uh, neighbors and plan commission recommended approval of it 11 to zero. Uh, the next public hearing 743 is a, a special permit request from Nicholas uh, Salazar for automobile car washing establishment C2 zoning at property located at 1701 Clay Avenue. Uh, we did receive a request um, from Mr. Salazar uh, to, to withdraw this case after the plan commission hearing. Uh, the uh, the uh, tenant of the uh, the lot uh, backed out of the lease and the owner uh, no longer wants to move forward with the special permit. Uh, because it already had gone to the plan commission, city council uh, must take action on the withdrawal. Uh, so council will need to open a public hearing, take any comments on withdrawal, uh, and then vote on the withdrawal. Um, if, if the council decides uh, not to approve the withdrawal, then we move forward with the hearing. Uh, staff does. Hey, Clint. Yes, sir. Sorry. Quick question for you on this one. If they want to come back and revisit this, would it have to go through the plan commission once again? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, staff does recommend approval of the, the withdrawal request. Uh, and then the last public hearing, 744, is uh, some rezoning from commercial uh, zoning to residential zoning on some uh, residential homes in our North Waco neighborhood. Uh, these are uh, seven homes uh, between 17th, uh, 18th Street and 19th Street in Herring and Proctor. Uh, you can see the star on there uh, that this uh, zone change was initiated by the owners of uh, 1815 Proctor and then the city expanded it, uh, staff expanded it to include uh, the rest of homes on that block. Uh, you can see the, the land use plan does call for that to be mixed use flex, uh, and which really makes more sense for it to be uh, residential land use, and then also residential zoning to bring all those uh, existing single family homes into the into conformance with our zoning ordinance. Uh, no opposition to this one in uh, plan commission recommended approval. Uh, here's the pictures of the, the homes. This is looking down Proctor uh, from 19th Street and then looking down Herring uh, from 19th Street, uh, the, the homes that are involved. Uh, and uh, Plan Commission did recommend approval. And that concludes my report. Thanks, Clint. Glad to see you back. Uh, any see questions? Back. Comments? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Clint. Mayor and Council, the next work session is uh, Work session 2027-38, which will be an update um, on and discussion of mental health initiatives. And I'm appreciative to uh, Ryan Holt, who continues to be a, a, um, a strong voice in this conversation community-wide. Uh, Ryan serves as our assistant city manager here at the City of Waco and will be leading this discussion today. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be before you to give an update on the state of mental health initiatives uh, in Waco. We'll go over an update uh, to the state of mental health initiatives. We'll give some context as to who the major community partners are in the efforts around mental health. And we'll talk a little bit about the ongoing work of those partners. Texas statutes identify the local mental health authority or the LMHC as the coordinator of behavioral health services in various regions of the state. In Central Texas, the Heart of Texas Region Mental Health Mental Retardation Center, commonly known as MHMR, serves as the LMHC for a six county region encompassing Waco, uh, which also includes the counties contained in our region, which are Bosque, Falls, McLennan, Limestone, Hill, and Freestone counties. Specifically, they provide services to individuals with intellectual development disabilities. They provide services to early childhood intervention, services related to child and adolescent mental health, a wide range of programs and services related to adult mental health. MHMR provides a number of veterans-based services through the Veterans One Stop Center. Additionally, MHMR provides substance abuse services and treatment, and they also provide a 24-hour hotline through a toll-free number. 
The McLennan County Behavioral Health Leadership Team, also known as the BHLT, is compromised of leadership from local mental health authority, health care providers, local government, and philanthropic foundations committed to aligning their resources to address mental health and substance abuse issues in our community. The BHLT was born out of a collaborative uh, mental health meeting that had been going on for a number of years and brought additional stakeholders to the table under the health arm of the collective impact work being done by Prosper Waco. Active participants include representatives from the organizations shown on the slide, among others. The mayor represents the city as a whole, and I've been fortunate enough to work with the BHLT during my time uh, with the police department. Because of the coordinated effort of the BHLT, several advances have been made to positively affect the overall continuum of care related to mental health in the area. These, advantage, these advances at the local level continue even while the state of Texas scales back funding for this critical public health issue. Some of these local enhancements are increased local treatment opportunities at the Central Texas Crisis Center, the creation of a mental health court, creation of a specialty court for veterans, creation of a pretrial diversion program at the district attorney's office, expanded mental health screening and treatment at the McLennan County Jail, enhanced housing opportunities for individuals with behavioral health issues, specialized services for postpartum depression uh, and parent-child attachment issues, opening of a child respite facility, specialized services for transitional age youth, specialized treatment tandems in multiple school districts, enhanced integrated physical and behavioral health treatment, and reintegration services for individuals leaving the criminal justice system. We'll take a closer look at initiatives born out of the BHLT collaboration a little later in this presentation. Despite these wide range of services, there are an increasing number of times that local behavioral health consumers find themselves in crisis. These crises will manifest themselves in situations where the person poses an immediate danger to themselves or another person, such as a family member. Though procedural changes have been made to mental health statutes over the years, the main portion of the code places authority with the LMHC to provide mental health services to residents, even against their will. Elected sheriffs and constables are required to assist the LMHC once a court has ordered long-term inpatient treatment in the state hospital system or at one of the private mental health facilities coordinated by the LMHC. Additionally, police are required to assist the LMHC when a mental health consumer must be taken against their will in what is called an emergency detention order. They must then deliver the patient to an inpatient treatment center for the acute behavioral health issue. Statutes provide that any peace officer may take a person into custody if the person is in a mental health crisis, the person represents a substantial risk of serious harm to themselves or others, and, is, and the situation is so volatile that there isn't time to obtain a warrant through a court hearing. In most situations, the patient can then be held up to 48 hours for the LMHC to complete a psychiatric evaluation. The other common method to obtain an EDO laid out in this section is that any adult may file a written application for the emergency detention of another person if all the criteria listed above are met. The application is usually made to the county judge who would then issue an emergency detention order that is the same as what a peace officer would sign and would require law enforcement to respond and take the person into custody. If the person is to receive treatment at one of the eight treatment centers in the Texas State Hospital System, they may need to be transported to El Paso, Big Spring, San Antonio, Rusk, Vernon, Terrell, Harlingen, or Austin. Seldom do mental health consumers find themselves in crisis from mental health symptoms in complete absence of other health issues. Because of this, officers who, take, who have taken a subject into custody on an emergency detention order now have to take the mental health consumer to a medical emergency room for medical clearance before a psychiatric evaluation can take place. The officers and the consumer wait like all other patients to be seen at the emergency room. In most every situation, this will take several hours. In most cases, once medical clearance has been obtained, the mental health consumer is then transported to the MHMR Crisis Treatment Center for psychiatric evaluation. If the person is found to be to need inpatient treatment, a bed in the state system or private provider must be identified and the originating agency is required to provide transportation to the facility. In the past, Waco PD has had to transport these patients as far as way as El Paso, though Austin is our primary destination. What this means from an operational standpoint is that for each crisis call, a minimum of two police officers are taken off the streets to deal with that call until it's finished. 2019 is the last full year of available data. For 2019 versus 2018, we saw suicide in progress calls hold just about steady at 974 or an average of just under three per day. 
The calls that resulted in an emergency detention order saw a 13.4% increase from 2018 to 2019. We went ahead and looked at the numbers so far for 2020 also and determined an estimated year end number using the first nine full months of the year to determine the trend for 2020. If those 2020 numbers hold up, you will see declines in both types of calls but as you'll see on the next slide, this decline will likely not reduce the number of personnel hours dedicated to mental health consumers in crisis. As you can see from this slide, there were, there were slight reductions in the length of both types of calls from 2018 to 2019. But if the trends continue in 2020, both of those gains will be erased and we will see increases in both types of calls with both setting record highs with suicide in progress call lengths increasing by 15.4% and the emergency detention order call link seeing a dramatic increase of 46.3%. Looking at the raw data for 2020, it appears that COVID likely had serious adverse effects on statewide mental health resources and the ability to place consumers who were in crisis into treatment facilities. The time for the longest single call for service soared to over 50 hours already in 2020. Hey Chief, so were those hours on that last slide? Is that the yes, unit of yes. measurement? Okay. Yes, sir, the okay. length in hours. Okay, thanks. Looking deeper in the year to date numbers for 2020 to see what effects COVID is likely having on resource allocation, you can see the number of reports is actually trending lower after initial spike in March of, for 2020. This slide shows the longest call for each month comparing 2019 to 2020. While 2019 only saw a seven hour deviation in the longest call, 2020 has seen a 39 hour deviation when considering the longest calls year to date. These significant fluctuations pose challenges when trying to identify appropriate staffing for the police department. The information from the department is that COVID has disrupted the normal systems in place for mental health resulting in these numbers. While this slide shows the extremes on length of these types of calls, it also mirrors the trends for the averages during these months as well. Recognizing the continued challenges, the behavioral health leadership team has expended significant time and resources trying to identify the potential solutions that could be most effective in the Waco community. The BHLT has explored successful programs in Colorado Springs, Gregg County, Texas, Lubbock, Austin, Tucson, San Antonio, and Lufkin, to name a few. Based on significant analysis, the BHLT is moving forward on several immediate responses and one long-term plan. The first consists of establishing a medical component at the existing crisis treatment center, utilizing a combination of physis physician coverage and residents. Before this initiative, the CTC did not have a physician available to treat individuals who may, have easily, who may have easily treatable medical conditions such as high blood pressure, diabetes, or minor cuts and bruises while at the crisis treatment center. This causes mental health consumers and officers to have to stop at the emergency departments for medical clearance or to be refused admission completely before getting a mental health evaluation. This not only creates a backlog in the local emergency departments, but also creates long waits for local law enforcement agencies that must remain with that individual until a disposition is rendered. The medical clearance, even for minor, minor medical issues, can take several hours in existing emergency departments. In order to resolve this issue, MHMR has created a program to place a physician to round four days a week at the crisis center and to provide coverage by family health center residents to screen individuals in the evenings and other times when the physician is not available to determine if they could be medically treated while receiving their psychiatric care at the crisis center. Ultimately, the long-term plan is to create a crisis hub that would include a full array of crisis supports that would be housed together. In this model, individuals in crisis would be dropped off by law enforcement and responsibility for their treatment would be transferred to the crisis hub staff. Services would include medical clearance, psychiatric consultation, short-term crisis medications, short-term counseling, case management services, crisis respite, crisis residential services, and substance abuse screening and referral. Additional services will be added as needs are identified in the community. One of the community-based initiatives is work on a collaborative approach to public goods investment to help address social drivers of mental health. This initiative is being led by Prosper Waco and this graphic comes courtesy of that organization. The project is trying to provide the framework that would potentially uh, identify wraparound support to members of the community with behavioral health leadership needs. The social care coordinators who would be ideally master's level trained social workers who would work with individuals to complete needs assessments, goal setting, and a social care plan. The community care connectors would be ideally paraprofessionals, preferably with community health worker credentialing, 
who would be there to follow up and provide navigation support, encouragement, and intensive follow up. Then local, local social resources could be tapped to help with financial needs, physical activity and wellness, self-development and success coaching, and could include parenting support and counseling. Some of these programs have shown documented success that show 30% fewer emergency room visits, 30% fewer inpatient admissions, and up to 40% fewer diagnostic tests using this, um, this program. As a new initiative, we see work around the career offender unit. When the idea around this unit was derived, it was initially about facing the challenge of continually driving the crime rate down in our area. In our discussions, I posed the challenge to staff to take a page out of the social work playbook, and if they could identify root causes for the offender's propensity to commit crime, that it would be preferable to help bring resources to bear to address those root causes rather than just arresting these offenders. Some of you may have seen news coverage of an early success this unit has had with a gentleman named Laron Hicks. The investigators discovered that Mr. Hicks had a substance abuse issue, which led to his criminal conduct. The unit reached out to Senecor, a community partner, and they were able to identify a treatment for Mr. Hicks. The unit has continued a supportive relationship with Mr. Hicks post-treatment, and while trying to help Mr. Hicks navigate some of the other hurdles tied to his behavior, the unit has found that not all parts of the criminal justice system are as ready to take a different tack towards reducing criminal behavior. As a result, the sergeant over the CCAST unit has reached out to resources, including Prosper Waco, to gauge the potential to have a social worker assigned to the unit to add more depth to their ability to take a non-traditional approach to reducing crime. As an example of ongoing initiatives, the police department formed the Family Violence Unit back in 1997 to provide specialized resources to the victims of family violence, but also to help provide offenders the life skills and training to avoid situations where they could reoffend. Since the inception of this unit, counselors and social workers have been a part of that unit to provide those specialized services involved in these very volatile cases. Finally, over the last couple of years, the police department partnered with the Tarleton School of Social Work to have social work students placed in cars with patrol officers and also located in the dispatch center as part of a research project to identify how many of the more than 100,000 annual calls for service are related to mental health issues and what initiatives could potentially have measurable success in reducing the strain that mental health calls place on local law enforcement resources. Unfortunately, COVID derailed some of that progress of the research. The hope is that once we get past COVID that a new chief will see the value in continuing the research as we look for long-term sustainable solutions uh, to the impact of mental health crisis on the community. And that is my presentation. Great pres presentation, Ryan. Really important topic that uh, continues to uh, need more resources than we can provide to it, but I appreciate everything that you, you're doing. Uh, are there questions or comments from council? Uh, Mayor, I don't have any questions. Oh, go ahead, Hector. Sorry. Uh, I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to say, uh, Chief, thank you so much for the presentation, and thank you so much for tackling such a, a strong and sensitive subject. You know, um, as Mayor Deaver mentioned, you know, this is something we, we cannot allocate enough resources to cover such a topic, um, and especially in the middle of a pandemic, we knew that uh not only are we we consistently talk about the health and the economic impact of a pandemic but very few times do we talk about the mental impact that it has on individuals and i'm glad to see that uh we are talking about it realizing that uh this crosses all generations all ethnicities all genders all age groups etc and that we are taking a proactive approach to really try to get a grasp and see how we can front this issue in our community. I'm also very appreciative of all the sponsors, excuse me, of all the partners that we have, like Prosper Waco, like McLennan County, uh, MHMR, et cetera. Uh, and so I'm just grateful for your leadership in this area and knowing that we still have work to do and, and we still have a long road ahead of us, but I'm glad that we are on the right path and we are just, and we are addressing this. So thank you so much, Chief. Yes, sir. And I'll just echo what, what uh, Councilman Sabido said there and, and being incredibly appreciative of this. Um, one point of clarification uh, I, I wanted to ask is, um, these efforts, I know it's it's virtually impossible to 
to stop someone from having a, a mental health episode that requires intervention um, on the front end. But would you say that a lot of these efforts are geared toward um, eliminating repeat occurrences with the same individuals? Because uh, uh, I know that that is a huge problem. I mean, not specific to McLennan County, you know, nationwide, that um, a lot of these same individuals are, are having mental health episodes and, and having recurring, you know, sometimes over 100 times in a year uh, run-ins with police because there's not uh, a diversion um, group there to, to come in and, and take that uh, sort of confrontation out of the equation. So is, is that something that's that's a, a part of this? Yes, sir, absolutely. That, that's, that goes to the core of what the crisis hub and those wraparound services would provide because when you get to the point where the, the consumer is in crisis, your tool belt gets very small um, to help them. Um, and so uh, the success of a number of programs around the country really focus on preventing people from going into crisis to begin with, getting them stabilized, providing wraparound services, a holistic approach uh, to their health. Because a lot of times families just don't have the resources or the knowledge to help members of their own family that are going through these, uh, through these mental health issues. Um, and so... So that is a the the stabilization and continued tracking is a is a vital part of all of these uh, programs. What we hope is that we see a dramatic decrease in those number of individuals that go into crisis, and so that your crisis services can be reduced as well. Um, and so that's a that's that that holistic approach to it. So thanks for bringing bringing that up. Um, S M Holt. Um, you mentioned the hub. Is there a specific timeline on that yet, or is that just in in our in game planning phase right now? Yeah, I think um, it's it's one of those things that that while I, I can't give you a specific timeline on it, we're as close as sure. we've ever been on it. Uh, and I think you have uh, the right folks in the community that are talking about it and identifying uh, potential funding sources and identifying the 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 collaborative impact. Um, I've been told that as, as some of the philanthropic organizations uh, go around mm -hmm. the country uh, touting the work of the BHLT, that, mm -hmm. that those funding sources are very impressed by the work that's been done mm -hmm. here and the collaborative approach of everybody getting on the same page. Um, so the, uh, the, the medical model at the at the crisis center is just a is just a start, and you have a lot of uh, a lot of those partners that are coming together and really forging a, a pathway forward to that crisis hub. Um, and so I think it's something uh, that we see in in the next few years for sure um, that that we can actually see on the horizon uh, without without giving a specific number of years there. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I I agree. I think it's something that would be incredibly beneficial. Um, and um, allow our other partners that 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 that's not specifically their job to go about doing their job. If there was somewhere that was safe, you know, for the the clients that need that type of treatment to be, and you know, allow police to police and allow um, uh, em emergency services to to do just that. So I look forward to the progress. Thank you. And I'll just echo that and say, uh, Chief, I appreciate you, uh, the mayor, y'all's leadership on this, along with so many other of our community partners. I mean, this really does need to be a collaborative effort to do it well. And I mean, I think to your point, we're getting there. And uh, and I'm so I, I this is I mean, this is a incredibly important issue that's pernicious and that takes a, a lot of different avenues to really address it appropriately. Um, and so I'm I, I'm I'm just I just want to say I'm supportive of all y'all are doing and. Uh, and look forward to seeing as, as uh, Mayor Pro Tem is just what the next, what, what it looks like going forward. So I, I appreciate y'all. Thanks, sir. All right. Thanks, Mayor and Council. Um, I want to invite uh, Interim Police Chief Frank Gench to the table to provide our next work session. It's work session 2027 39. And it's a discussion of 2020 homicides. Chief. Honorable Mayor and City Council, I'm here this afternoon to provide you with an update on homicides that have occurred so far this year. 
to have a full understanding on how homicides are classified, the Texas Penal Code defines murder as when a person intentionally or knowingly causes the death of an individual. Manslaughter is when a person recklessly causes the death of an individual. And criminal negligent homicide is when a person causes an individual's death by criminal negligence. So far this year, the city of Waco has, has experienced 15 homicides. 11 of these cases have been cleared by arrest. One case will be reviewed by a grand jury for a self-defense issue. Two cases have an identified person of interest pending further investigation before an arrest can be made. The nationwide homicide clearance rate for 2018, the last year available, was 62%. And our clearance rate this year is currently at 73%. This map shows the location of the 2020 homicides. The 15 homicides in Waco thus far in 2020 is higher than the yearly totals over the last 10 years, which range from a low of four in 2018 to a high of 12 in 2015. Although our overall crime rate is down, this increase in homicides is concerning and something we're taking very seriously. As noted in the case chart, four of the homicides were the result of family violence. Four were drug related. Three occurred during civil disturbances. Two, the motive was robbery. One was gang related and one case we're still investigating and don't have a clear motive. Although homicides frequently occur due to factors beyond the control of law enforcement, the Waco Police Department aggressively investigates these cases and seeks to arrest suspects. Additionally, the following strategies have been or are being implemented to reduce violent crimes, including homicide. The Family Violence Unit, which consists of a sergeant and five detectives, has recently been assigned an additional investigator. The new detective will assist with the unit caseload and will also provide additional resources for proactive activities being developed by the supervisor. The investigators regularly work with legal advocates, judges, and prosecutors to hold offenders accountable and to protect victims of family violence. The Special Crimes Unit, which consists of a sergeant and six detectives, has recently been assigned an additional investigator. This unit, which investigates homicides, frequently conducts lengthy and complex investigations and will benefit, and will benefit greatly from the additional detective. We were able to add these detectives to these two sections thanks to the Council's priority on public safety and by improving and by approving an increase in our authorized staffing in the 1920 budget. The Texas Anti-Gang Center, TAG, became operational as of the beginning of this month. The TAG is comprised of approximately 60 local, county, state, and federal personnel focused on addressing gangs, drugs, and violent crime in the central Texas area. The cooperative effect of sharing information and resources by the constituent agencies has already proven successful in other areas of the state. The City of Waco has recently been awarded funding for the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, or NIBIN. This equipment will allow investigators to image ballistic evidence and identify possible matches to evidence from other crime scenes. Allow, allowing us to connect separate shooting scenes and help identify those responsible. We are hoping to have these, this system up and running in a few months. Of the 15 cases we've had this year, this, graphic, this graph shows the number of cases that each strategy would apply to. Homicide cases can be the most complex of cases that the police department investigates. Additionally, each case makes a significant impact 
on the detectives called to solve the case. I know this personally because I worked in this unit in the early 90s. And one of my cases ultimately achieved a guilty plea from the, from the suspect some 25 years after the murder. The men and the women of the Special Crimes Unit are very well trained and truly dedicated, working tirelessly to solve these cases, to bring justice for the victims, and to bring closure for the families left behind. And that concludes my presentation. If y'all have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you, Steve. Really appreciate the presentation and uh, the great work that your uh, officers are doing. Uh, I'll open it up to questions from or comments from council members. Uh, Chief Gens, thank you so much for the presentation. I really do appreciate it. I know this is something that I asked for in a few council meetings ago because um, it has been very alarming to me and many people of the city of Waco, the number of homicides that we've seen in 2020. Um, I think you even mentioned it in your presentation. This is this this year had we've seen more homicides than uh, in in over 15 years. I think the next one was 2004. Um, and I do appreciate you listing uh, the victims that we have lost this year due to senseless acts of violence. Um, individuals like Joe Angel Ortegon and Sakaira Young, Darius Holder, Keith Barrier, John Breeding, Aquarius McFall, and so many more. All of these individuals are sons, our daughters, our brothers, our sisters, our mom dads and it is very hurtful when we lose someone to a senseless act of violence i am grateful that we live in a community where we take this seriously i'm grateful that we have a police department that doesn't hide or um, stay away from these difficult issues I'm very grateful that Waco PD is taking a proactive approach in how to try to prevent these homicides from happening in the future or at this rate. Um, I love that, that we are gonna have another detective in our family violence unit. Uh, I fully support another detective in our special crimes unit. Uh, the Texas Anti-Gang Center that I know that, that Waco PD and, and the city of Waco have been working on uh, for close to a year now that's coming to fruition. I'm grateful for that. And then, of course, the Ballistic Information Network. All of these strategies that you outlined in your presentation, I think, are going to, not, not I think, I know will do the work to minimize the senseless violence that we're currently experiencing. Um, but also make Waco a safe place where people know that they can raise their families, no matter what part of the city you in, you're in. Uh, a, a place where children can be playing in the front yard or the backyard, riding their bicycle, not worrying about any violence. Um, and, and a place where a mom doesn't have to worry if her son is going to come home late at night because of some violence that happened in the streets. And so I, I thank you for taking time out to make this presentation. And I also want to offer my condolences to all of the all the families that have lost individuals this year and in the past years to these acts of violence. I can tell you that we take it very seriously as well as a council. Uh, we do not take it lightly and we would do our part to ensure that Waco is that safe place that you desire to raise your family in. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Chief, for the presentation. Um, it's, as Councilmember Sabito said earlier, it's one of those things where, you know, our goal is to make sure that we are in the safest environment that's possible. 
um, I think it's important and I am looking forward to seeing the collaborative work with TAG and the other units, um, Special Crimes, because, you know, what what are homicide numbers, you know, that's that's the actual loss of life, but there's so many other violent acts that are occurring and, you know, um, shot, you know, drug deals gone bad and people shooting in folks' houses. And it's that part is as, you know, as important as solving, you know, these, these homicides. And so, you know, I am looking forward to the collaborative work because we have got to curb this, this, this crisis that we're going through because, you know, it's one thing for folks not to come home at night, but it's another thing to be sitting around doing the things that I'm doing every day, watching TV, sitting on my porch and bullets fly past me, you know, and that's, that's not acceptable either. So that we are increasing our efforts with tag and doing those things is, is hopeful to me. Um, but it's something that, you know, I know I'm, and let me just speak for district one that I am, I am, I am championing because this has got to stop. Um, you know, and, and we've got to do all the things that we have to do. And that, that, you know, the, the cause of, of crime is just as much our responsibility as the, you know, as, as protection of said crime. Um, so we're, we're all needing to, to really bear down and get to the root, um, as well as find efforts to quell the actual acts. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that all the initiatives and, partnerships with with different entities i mean we've got i think every um justice organization has offices within this city and i i look forward to you know diligent work with all of those entities with the men and women of waco pd to to get this under you know under control now Growing up here, I know we've had peaks and valleys in those things, and we've all had to kind of buckle down and figure out what it's going to take to to ease this season. Um, so I'm looking forward to the work uh, of PD and you, you know, um, and leadership to see this through. What I would like to see is I know that some districts are affected more than others, and so you know, because at the end of the day. You know, when we're meeting with our neighborhood associations and when we're, you know, seeing folks in the store and whatever, and the questions come about neighborhood safety, I would like to have uh, a more personal um, uh, answers, you know, district specific. So I'm hoping that that perhaps going forward, you know, and I know, you know, I, I pick up the phone and call all the time, as you well know, and, and ACM Holt knows too, um, and uh, which I will continue to do. But um, I want to see it in the efforts that, you know, along with homicides, but the work that TAG is doing on the other, you know, violent crimes and drugs and gang activities, that we can have more individualized uh, district by district um, reports. Because I think that if we look at it that way, then we, when we're asked, we can give... Um, intelligent, knowledgeable answers about what's happening. I mean, I'm, and I know that we're uh, thankful to council's approval for community policing efforts, that that's but one way to work on this, getting people actively engaged in their, within their communities. And, um, and when I say people, I mean PD, because, you know, we all have buy-in and tie-in to the neighborhoods that we're responsible to and for. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at all of these resources that we now have and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful in, in going forward that what, what Waco will be, you know, once, once all of these resources come come together and begin working on the changes that we need to see for the safety of our citizens and our community. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. And, and I agree with you. And the collaboration is not only internal, uh, but external, like we've talked about with the different agencies. But internally, the detectives, what I'm real happy about is our detectives internally are communicating with each other. Our special crimes detectives are, are communicating with the detectives that are handling the deadly conducts and those discharge of firearms were, were, as you said, you know, houses are being shot up during disturbances and drug deals. 
they're collaborating together and then they're collaborating with the drug enforcement and tag unit. So that communication is there so we're not missing those pieces. And so I'm real proud of the, the work internally, you know, our officers and detectives are doing and they're sharing that information. And now we have the tag unit where we have more resources to sh share the information. And in addition, you know, we worked with the federal uh, magistrates and the, you know, the AUSA's office. So we even have that federal ability to reach out to them when, when the time is needed to. So I really appreciate your comments. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate your time today. Yes, sir. Mayor and Council, our final work session presentation um, is a discussion of the Parks and Recreation Department's virtual holiday lighting plans, Waco Wonderland, as well as uh, a discussion by City Center Waco and the Public Improvement District's downtown lighting project. We're joined at the table by Jonathan Cook, our Director of Parks and Recreation, and I believe we have Jeffrey Viterius joining us uh, from City Center Waco in a few moments virtually. And yes, sir. Mayor and Council, um, Mayor Deaver and Councilmember Kennard have filed affidavit of substantial interest on this item. <coughs> Very good. Well, thank you, Bradley, and hello, Council, and thanks for having me today. And, um, you know, a brief look outside, and you can tell the uh, sun's days are getting a little shorter here. We're starting to get some spells of cold weather. And uh, typically what that means is uh, we're in full gear for Waco Wonderland. And, and I think last night when my kids were asking me, I have two young boys, they were saying, well, what do you got going on tomorrow? And I was like, well, I'm going to talk about Waco Wonderland. And my youngest kid, he still doesn't understand why we don't have a Ferris wheel in downtown all the time. But uh, my 10-year-old... You know, he was like, well, what's it going to look like this year? And, you know, I started to describe because obviously things are a little bit different when you come to gatherings. And it made me realize, like, you know, this conversation is how are we going to be able to create a December to remember? Oh, excuse me. A December to remember for Waco Wonderland this year. And I tell you, we, we really have. We've been doing this now seven, eight years and created the generations of kids and families that have gone out. And it's really become a strong Waco tradition for downtown. So we're going to look at the history of Waco Wonderland today, um, how we've created the holiday magic in downtown Waco and uh, what we're calling a virtual welcome to the holidays. And as Bradley mentioned, we're going to look at the expanded uh, downtown holiday decor to be able to add some excitement to December. Oh. First off, um, the history of Waco Wonderland. Um, back in 2012, uh, we came to an end of a run of an event called Holiday on the Square. And uh, that was put on by several organizations down at Holiday uh, Heritage Square. And, and it become a tradition, but uh, for those of us who were here, we came back and things had sort of gone their own way. And we had a tree lighting for city council, and I'm pretty sure that city council were the only people there. <laughs> and uh, it, it, we looked around, and I tell you, at the time, the council members and also managers said, that wasn't right. And so we wanted to look back and, and really figure out how we could collaborate with our community and create a special event that downtown deserved. This was right when downtown was starting its resurgence. And so what we've done is created Food, Fun, and Cheer since 2013. And each year, this event has grown by leaps and bounds. As you can see from this picture, and I know y'all have joined us to light the tree each year, a great fireworks show, you know, thousands of people coming down, and really a great experience. So... We wanted a, the flagship event, uh, no doubt. We wanted something that people, not just in the summer, but in the winter, and, and something to drive people to the merchants and really show them that downtown experience. And so it started as a collaboration between the City of Waco and our Parks and Recreation Department uh, and looking at the planning and the management and the staffing of an event. And then we pulled in and really had a lot of help from City Center Waco over the years as they go out and raise sponsorships and really play a key critical role in uh, communicating and getting our downtown merchants involved. And the final piece of the puzzle for Waco Wonderland was the Downtown Public Improvement District number one. And not only they have a budget contribution, but they really bought uh, a lot of the committee support to us and a lot of the initial ideas on how to get this event off the ground. And we started with an eight day event back in 2013. And uh, I tell you, that was a, a long event. I've done events for a long time and eight days straight can really wear you out. But we started off strong. We had an uh, artificial skating rink and some of the key elements 
And then back in 2016, we decided to go a little more bang for the buck and put it all in one weekend. So the other weekends could be spread out so people would go to the other attractions in downtown. And that's when we brought in the snow tube hill as well. So how do we create this magic? We've done it through things like the Wonderland Run with communities and schools, the downtown holiday parade with, with local churches and organizations really showing support as people line up and down Austin Avenue. School groups perform on our main stage. Obviously, you can't have uh, you know Christmas without a visit from Santa Claus and the Santa House. And you have the towering uh, Wonderland, Wonderland wheel there. And these are all things as we look at it and we started planning this year and unfortunately due to COVID, uh, we saw other events and whether that be the Ironman event or Silobration or even the Veterans Day Parade, all very special events, but recreating those gatherings at this time, it's just not practical and, and it's not safe. And so what we've come up with is a virtual kickoff to you know, really complement this magic. So in the past, we've had 25,000 total attendance uh, is how it's grown selling over 8,000 wristbands to the rides and the snow hill. Our mistletoe market has grown to where we have 45 uh, different merchants and artists that come to downtown, and then also food truck vendors in that as well. And, and really a place where people capture those magical moments. And of course you have lights, and then you have downtown in December to where you have things going on throughout the month. So looking at it virtually, we wanted to do a kickoff for the holidays and really get people in the spirit and really, uh, you know, connect with the kids. And then also, as you'll look at the lights, we'll talk about giving the people to still come downtown to explore. But on Friday, December 4th, we're going to be hosting a virtual tree lighting ceremony. Um, as we've done with a lot of our press conferences and ribbon cuttings, we'll have uh, city officials and council members. And this will be aired not only on our social media accounts, but a, a big collaboration with Larry Holsey and his crew at the Cable Channel. And so we'll kick off with the virtual tree lighting ceremony, which will be followed up. Uh, we've got some great footage of previous firework shows with music. So we'll be doing the tree lighting ceremony followed by some fireworks. And then we're gonna film a video light tour to give people a sneak peek of what it would be like if they come down on their own cars to see the lights in downtown. On that next day on the Saturday, uh, we're starting off with the virtual Wonderland run and walk uh, to where people can still get out on their own accord and uh, get out and explore, enjoy the river walk as they've done in the past, just not in that large group setting. setting. And then switching to the afternoon, once again, at broadcasting, we're going to have a welcome from Santa. We've been able to pull some strings and have some contacts to where we're going to have an introduction and Santa's going to greet everyone. And he's also going to have some reindeer on site as well. And we're going to have some talks with some of the keepers and really just, a, you know, a fun moment to where kids can have that little interaction as virtual as possible. And that night, we're going to have story time with Santa and the reindeer as well. And we're going to have three different stories read at 6, 7, and 8 o'clock to where you can sit down with your kids with some cookies and some hot chocolate. And we'll have Santa reading some stories. And uh, we think that's going to be a nice addition on the Saturday. And on the Sunday, we're going to be following up to where uh, many of y'all know Larry Holsey does a great job in filling City Hall with the sounds of the seasons. And uh, though we're not able to do that this year and have people inside, we have recordings of that. So whether you're setting up your Christmas tree in your house or, or getting together on a Sunday afternoon watching some football, you can put on the sounds of the seasons to have some carols playing. And I tell you, it, it's just a little bit that we know we want to do something. And we want people to remember this year, but also remember that Wonderland does hold a special place in the heart of many Way Cohens. And uh, at this time, I want to turn it over to Jeffrey as he's going to tell what City Center has been working on to add a little more pizzazz and dazzle to downtown in regards to the lighting. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, city management, uh, city staff, mayor, members of council. Uh, we're really excited to be here and kind of talk about holiday decor 2020. Just for some, some brief background, in uh, 2019, the downtown public improvement district uh, jumped into holiday decor. Uh, historically, the, the PIDs provided some beautification elements, but this was our first year really engaging on the holiday decor front. And we added some red bows on Austin and Elm Avenue. With the experience of that, that 2019 season, um, in the spring and summer of this year, PID staff started meeting with the city 
uh, city CVB and parks departments to work through the, uh, the work through the possibility of finding a, a design firm to really level up our, our holiday decor in downtown. The idea being to, to work towards a multi-year uh, engagement with a firm and a, a focused one-year scope um, to, to kind of start building that partnership up. This, this collection of CVB, PID, and city uh, and, uh, and park staff uh, put together a request for qualifications, developed a valuation criteria, and then ultimately ended up having to kind of flex our plans around the COVID-19 realities, uh, particularly around funding. Um, thankfully, Parks and CBB have been able to provide assets and the PID has been able to provide funding this year to, to kind of bridge this, this kind of uh, financially difficult time. And we can advance. Um, we did. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, on August 28th, 2020, uh, CVB, Parks, and PID staff all met, uh, reviewed the, the uh, responses we'd received to the request for qualifications. All three groups independently scored the responses, and all three recommended Shrarium's company for negotiation. Uh, throughout September, City Center Waco staff negotiated a final scope of work uh, in collaboration with CVB and the Parks team and the oversight of the uh, volunteers of the Downtown Public Improvement District boards and committees. Um, then October 6th, uh, the, the contract itself was brought to y'all for review and approval. Uh, we were able to achieve some cost savings by incorporating existing elements. Um, and we were also able to kind of fit our budget by combining purchase and lease. So for our kind of base level decor, lights mostly, those will be purchased so they can be reused year after year after year. Whereas some of the decorative elements, some of the larger elements, some of the, the less base elements are going to be on a lease basis so that they can be theoretically swapped out in future years. As new areas emerge, uh, for example, Bridge Street, they can be added into this structure. And in fact, we've already asked Jerome to start taking a look at how Bridge Street could be a kind of uh, second core for holiday decor once it is completed. Oh, uh, so what we have here is a kind of high level overview of the central area of the holiday decor we'll be working with. Um, we'll be dealing with Heritage Square here in just a second, but I did want to highlight the elements over by the, the convention center around the Freedom Fountain. We'll be having trunk lighting, uh, carry it on from the previous year, but we'll also be adding some lighted pull mount elements uh, to help give a vertical uh, design element and make it almost feel like there's a canopy of light in that area. Additionally, on the convention center wall uh, where there was a wreath last year, we've kind of taken that element and leveled it up by adding in a flying W to that wreath. So the flying W itself will be made out of a, a red glitter mesh material and the wreath will be, of course, green. The, the W will be outlined in red lighting and the wreath in the warm white that is throughout the entire, the entire uh, holiday decor design here. And so during the day, you'll have contrast between the green wreath and the red W. And at night, you'll have the contrast between the, white, the, the warm white lights and the red lights on the W. Um, we can go ahead to the next slide. So focusing in on Heritage Square, um, we'll continue with trunk lighting like we've had in the past. You can kind of see an image there on the, the right hand of your screen of some trunk lighting. We're adding in some canopy spritzers. That's the far right picture you see there. These are, or, or starbursts, the, the pictures you see here are a single size. Um, we're actually going to have a variety of three different sizes, ranging from this to about double that size, all throughout the trees around Heritage Square, to once again give a vertical element and, and something a little bit different from the, the trunk lighting below. Um, additionally, the, the tree will be placed, uh, the, the, the tree that's historically in the Heritage Square parking lot there will be moved into the, the green area by the pergola and the Santa house, as, as Jonathan mentioned, will be, will be present though as a decorative item, not as something uh, folks can go inside. Um, and then if we can move forward one more, uh, and Jonathan, if you could start that video playing, um, Here's an example. This is an element we're the, really excited Aurora. about. In the pergola across from the Santa House, we're, uh, we're working on adding in this 
interactive responsive lighting. Now in the, the map you see there, we have it labeled as a tunnel, but this is actually just going to be within the pergola. It's all gonna be open air, um, nothing, nothing enclosed. And as you walk through it, the lights will actually react to the sounds you're making, whether you're singing or talking or even just clapping, and will give a kind of interactive feel to, to the decorative elements uh, that are present. Uh, then some additional elements that'll be kind of throughout downtown. We'll have the bows we used last year on Austin and Elm. They'll be deployed again. We're working on some new holiday banners, uh, about 100 light poles throughout downtown. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be installed there. Uh, we're working to make sure that those uh, banners uh, work well with the district banners and the uh, mask up banners that are already present so that all of them kind of work with each other rather than against each other. And then finally, we're also looking at the idea of a handful of kind of unique banners, something a little bit different from what we have throughout downtown, kind of sprinkled throughout to, to kind of engage with people to go find the X number of some things. So um, that's what we're looking at. Thank you, Jeffrey. And um, as you can see, you know, with things taking on a different shape, I, I think the priority is, is one, creating that memory and, and then also still getting people to our downtown merchants, which has always been um, at the forefront of having such an event. And Jeffrey was right. He, he mentioned the, uh, the tree and the Santa house. We're still going to have those up as photo ops that families can come down and take those photos throughout the month. But with that, if you have any questions, even in regards to the lighting or the Waco Wonderland virtual schedule, um, I'm here for you to let, let you know. Hey, Jonathan, this is Hector. Thank you so much for the presentation and and thank you for 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 uh, taking us down uh, memory lane with, with the parade starting in 2013. I, I very well remember that parade when we brought it back because uh, I was one of the coordinators for that parade. Uh, and in 2013, the weather was beautiful all December, except the day that we had the parade. Uh, I think we woke up to something like 22, 23 degrees that morning. <laughs> we, we were frozen for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. But but those are the humble beginnings that I appreciate so much. And so thank you for for uh, this presentation and thank you for letting us know what the plan is as we move into fourth quarter. Question about not not so much question about the events, but how will, how are we going to get the word out to a community that's used to seeing Wake of Wonderland and the fireworks show and the downtown parade, et cetera? Sure. We've, uh, well, it, as with any event, I mean, the marketing remains the same uh, with the marketing plan that we've had in previous years. And one great thing about it is... Uh, the level of responsiveness and followers on our Waco Wonderland Facebook page is one of the most followed pages in the city. We have over 25,000 followers, but we're also working with our local media outlets uh, to making sure that we do spread the word. And I can tell you by the amount of calls that we've gotten, uh, people are wondering what's going on. So we definitely wanted to sure. speak to y'all today and we'll have our marketing campaign rolling out shortly. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. I just want to make sure you know, I. Uh, uh, communication is one of my big things and making sure that we get get the word out to our community so they know what our plans are as a city. And, and I even think it'll give that message of, of even in the middle of a pandemic, uh, what we are, that we're saying no large gatherings and we're putting that into practice on our end as well. So I think that's very, very good. Uh, speaking of that, and, and it's, this goes down to uh, the holiday celebration, et cetera, and I know we're talking a lot about Christmas, uh, but have you or your department has, has discussed Halloween protocols coming on behalf of the city as well? Well, I will say in regards to our department, Hector, and the calls that we've gotten. Jonathan? I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're not, uh, Council Member Sabino, we're not posted to talk about the Halloween. Um, it was specifically posted for uh, the, the week, Wake of Wonderland. Um, mm -hmm. There is a resolution regarding the emergency um, declaration. And so we could very, very, very briefly talk about uh, Halloween. But I don't know that Jonathan's the right person to talk about that. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, it's just, I know when, when I made the request for um this topic a few council meetings ago I, I i acknowledge halloween in there as well because i wanted to make sure we covered that before the actual uh, ho uh holiday took place 
Well, we we apologize because we didn't staff didn't pick that up that uh, that request up. Um, and I don't know if Deidre wants to very briefly under the emergency declaration uh, talk about Halloween real quickly. So uh, specific health member from the um, health district standpoint. Well, while we as a community have not are have not discouraged um, Halloween activities, we are encouraging individuals to um, practice all the appropriate safety protocols in regards to um, how individuals decide to distribute candy um, and or how they how they do gather that it is in much smaller groups um, that folks are um, if they are making the decision to do door to door trick or treating that they do that only with individuals out of their own household and that those okay. they are um, staying appropriately distanced and wearing masks in order our community spread for COVID-19 is still uh, really high. And so we still, we, while we understand that individuals still want to participate in this particular day, um, we want do individuals to do it very safely. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that. And, and I apologize on the confusion, but uh, I, I just know I've been receiving questions about it. Uh, but it's going back to uh, the holiday, I guess. Jonathan, thank you so much for the presentation. And I look forward to um, a different and virtual uh, holiday celebration this year. Jonathan and Jeffrey, thank you for this presentation. You know that um, uh, downtown uh, was was my bag for a long time. So, and Hector and I were in the cold, um, <laughs> working on on these presentations in those five a.m. Uh, KWTX remotes um, for Wonderland. But um, so I'm really excited to see this. I love the um, additional light show. Um, I think that it'll allow people to still see and be a part, even though we won't be able to to do the large scale things, but it still gives us the essence of the city of Waco ushering in the holiday season and with those offerings. You know, of course, um, I have been advocating for the holiday parade to cross the bridge into East Waco for a long time. So anything that we see to upgrade and include uh, the uh, cross the river side of the pit as well. I, I'm certainly in support of and for. I think the Bridge Street addition will be amazing. So um, I will encourage folks to, you know, meander a bit and get to see see what's going on downtown. I love a hidden banner or a scavenger hunt for a banner because you know it gives people an opportunity to seek and find and when they seek and find go to seek and find one thing they often end up finding many 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 others and that's the touch that we want to have for our downtown merchants and businesses now as we are going to our virtual approach um i offer um uh, an addition to what we're doing in our storytelling and our, our messaging that you know we do have this opportunity in this virtual environment to offer cross-cultural holiday stories as well. So I think that that's something that we should look at and consider uh, because we do have uh, multicultural communities here in this city and um, we all have a story of, of winter or holiday or familial celebration around. So I think that, you know, you know, maybe some of those story times could be dedicated for that. So I just wanted to to put that in the in the bucket for consideration. I think it would make a um, a welcome impact and 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 touch to our communities to um, let you know everyone know that we we see you and we we appreciate the um, uniqueness that you bring to this city and to our culture and 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 being a part of this celebration in whatever way we can. Thanks, though. We will. Thank Thanks you. It's a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Hey, this is Darius. Um, that was, yeah, a fantastic presentation. I just want to say thanks for the, the effort and thought put into specifically wanting to still create a memorable December. Um, and I think that's such a such a need right now, specifically as people are cooped up in their homes and people with family and children, um, as, 
as holidays draw near and it's not as easy to explain, like you mentioned at the start of your presentation, not quite as easy to explain to your younger children, hey, this is why we're not doing this thing that we normally do. Uh, I think it's incredible uh, what you guys are doing and, and really vital to still allow the opportunity to create memories, um, specifically tied to uh, you know this time of year um, where so many people have so many expectations and memories from their childhood. So thank you for effort uh, that you've put in to, to make that uh, uh, possible for the people of Waco. And I don't know if Jeffrey is still on the call, but um, if you are, Jeffrey, thank you so much. And, and the, the people at City Center Waco for uh, going out, getting the, the, the nitty gritty details down and, and, uh, and making this uh, possible for the city to, to, put on for the rest of our citizens. Um, so thank you for all your work in that. Uh, and that's all. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you all. All right, that's all the uh, work session presentations, isn't it, uh, Bradley? Yes, sir. Okay, are there any requests for future agenda items? Mayor, I don't have a, a, a request for a future agenda item, and I know I've been talking a lot, but I wanted to acknowledge uh, a f some I wanted to acknowledge a few Waco PD officers. A couple of weeks ago, there was a disturbance at one of my rental properties, and Waco PD called me um, and, and, and truly not knowing who I was and explained the situation to me, met me, met me at the rental property, uh, did a walkthrough with me, make sure everything was okay. And these officers were some of the most courteous, most respectful, most thoughtful, uh, police officers that I've encountered. And please keep in mind, once again, they didn't, nor did I expect them to know who I was. Uh, but I really just want to uh, thank Officer Moreno, Officer Rozinski, and Officer Carlisle for uh, just being great police officers. Like I said, very thoughtful, uh, very caring, making sure that all of my questions were answered. Um, and that just goes to show you the type of officers we have serving in our city and in our community. Uh, and so today I just really wanted to thank them publicly for all of their work and, and making sure that uh, myself and my property and everything was okay. So I just really wanted to acknowledge him for that. Okay, thank you, Hector. Um, there uh, being no request for future agenda items, we will now recess the work session, reconvene regular session for executive session that's read into the record by the city secretary at 4.52 p.m. Notice is hereby given that the city council will go into executive session in accordance with the following provisions. One, real property, Texas Open Meetings Act, Section 551.072. Two, economic development, Texas Open Meetings Act, Section 551.087. And three, personnel, Texas Open Meetings Act, Section 551.074. City Manager Bradley Ford. All right. We're now in executive session at 4.53 p.m.